I want to talk a little bit about the brain because it seems like this is a bit of a specialty area for you when looking at uh, neurodegeneration and the use of photobiomodulation. So um, where did where did the use of um, photobiomodulation start in looking at healing neurodegenerative diseases? Well, I mean, the, the, the first big application for photobiomodulation of the brain was actually in stroke, where there was a, a company called Phototherra that actually got to phase three trials of a near-infrared laser treatment for stroke. So this was patients who were brought to the emergency room within 24 hours of a stroke, had near-infrared light put on their head. Um, in the trial, they actually had the head shaved. It was all over the head, but they had a laser. Um, now, the phase one and the phase two trials were actually very promising and had significant advantages to this. But the large phase three trial actually did not reach a significant effect. So it was abandoned and the company unfortunately went bust. So an awful lot of people lost money and lost um, uh, lost belief in the effectiveness of photobiomodulation for the brain because of the failed stroke trial. Now, there was a single treatment with light within 24 hours. And although a single treatment works fine in mice and rats and even rabbits, I think it's unreasonable that a single treatment would work perfectly in humans. Um, so that really stopped the use of PBM for stroke. Now, we did a lot of studies of PBM for traumatic brain injury in mice and rats in the laboratory, and that worked fine as well. And again, a single exposure could remarkably protect the mice and the rats from you know, neurological disability and uh, increase the learning and memory and uh, reverse depression and anxiety and all these symptoms you get with chronic traumatic brain injury. Um, so then people started to use it on humans and both for acute TBI, which was a trial at Mass General, and then chronic TBI, which Marnie Naser and uh, her group have, have uh, carried on. So that seems to work well, and other people are doing it for TBI now, usually chronic TBI, because the cute is really difficult to do. You've got to get people who are brought into the emergency room with a head injury, and um, it's not easy to do those trials. But chronic TBI is an awful lot of people who's lives are pretty much destroyed because they had a head injury and they you know they never really recover from it and it helps these people a lot so then <clears throat> you know people started to think about neurodegenerative disease which was uh, <clears throat> uh lou lim and violet focused on alzheimer's and in in australia there you're focusing on parkinson's and the results from both these seem to be very promising. Um, you know, and now you can get LED helmets that you can put on, near-infrared LEDs, or the Violite have their specific headset that they claim excites, you know, specific parts of the brain. Um, and now other folks are looking at psychiatric disorders. So it seems to be very good for depression and Paolo Cassano at Mass General has a photobiomodulation clinic for depression patients who don't respond to antidepressant drugs. Um, anxiety, that seems to work well. Fred Schiff has just recently um, started working on opiate addiction. So by putting near-infrared light on the head, you can significantly reduce opioid cravings. And you may ask how all these things work. So, and there are many 
actions are fed by modulation on the brain. But one of the most exciting is it reorganizes the brain connections of synapses. So we can reorganize synapses, create new synapses, and basically help the brain to rewire itself. You know, so a lot of these brain disorders like depression, anxiety, drug addiction, insomnia, are due to inappropriate wiring pathways in the brain, which have sort of built up over the years, if you like. And if you can kind of shake them all up and with the effects of light, you can help them to reestablish the right connections. Um, obviously, you know, it increases cerebral blood flow, cerebral oxygenation, mitochondrial, um, metabolism and as you know the brain consumes a large proportion of the body's glucose and oxygen <laughs> considering its weight um, so increasing the energy um, production in the brain is a big deal um, reducing inflammation is important many brain disorders have excessive levels of neuroinflammation. So the microglia are inappropriately activated and they're producing lots of cytokines. And also failing to remove things. So if you've got amyloid plaque in your brain, the microglia are trying to remove it, right? But they're failing. And instead of removing the plaque, they're just pumping out cytokines, which is really damaging. So by switching these microglia from the M1 state to the M2 state, you can reverse the inflammatory cytokines, but also stimulate them to engulf the amyloid plaque, which is why studies actually show that the amyloid plaque load is, is reduced in the brain. And there, are, there are many brain disorders that are characterized by unwanted protein aggregates. And it's possible that photobiomodulation may be able to help all of these. And you're suggesting that it's a it's an indirect effect through the microglial cells that are helping to clean up the, the brain um, that are being yeah, stimulated by the red light. That's well, the near-infrared light, because it's... Yeah. Red light doesn't really get into the brain. If, if the systemic effect by being absorbed by the blood is important, then you probably could use red light. But most people use a near-infrared helmet on your head, and especially the forehead where there's no hair. Try and get as much light into the brain. Does it have to be um, placed directly on the head? I know there, are, there were some uh, studies done that looked at anywhere they could get light to get to the bone marrow would have a systemic effect through these um, mitokines, these mitochondrial signaling cells. Is, is that, could you approach it from that, that direction as well? Well, you know, obviously a lot of the healing effects of photobiomodulation rely on the stimulation of stem cells and progenitor cells. I mean, that's one reason why it's so healing things. Now, you obviously, the main niche for stem cells in the body is the bone marrow. I mean, there are niches all over, but certainly the bone marrow has the most stem cells. Now, the question is, how much light gets to the bone marrow? I mean, bones are transparent to light. I mean, they scatter light quite well, but they're actually white, so they don't absorb light. So it's possible that you know, the light can scatter around the bones and get to the bone marrow. Um, you know, Uri Oron, who works on this, generally, you know, in large animals, inserts a fiber into the bone marrow, usually the shin, who actually drills a hole into the bone and sticks a fiber in. Um, but in humans, no, he didn't do that. He just shone it on the human and he detected increased circulating progenitor cells. So it's quite possible that, you know, if you had a large panel, you would increase the circulating progenitor cells. 
Now, in the, you put the light on the head, the skull has calvarial bone marrow. So there's bone marrow in your skull. And that would get the light before the brain, right? So it's possible that you're stimulating the stem cells in the skull 